All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're going to get the event started. Um, to introduce myself, my name is David Chan. I am the president of the Berkeley College Republicans. And it is a pleasure to welcome our speakers and our audience here today to our atrocities of the CCP speaker event. Um, I wanted to start off by thanking our courageous speakers for coming all the way around from different states, from the different areas, to share their testimonies uh, regarding their heartbreaking experiences and suffering under the Chinese Communist Party. With us today, we have Mr. Bob Fu, Ms. Li Aiji, Mr. Fan, Mr. Fang Zhang, Ms. Gang Ho, Mr. James Gori, and Ms. Ming Hui Wang. It's incredibly important, not just for us to fight for freedom of speech, religion, and expression, but essential to the survivorship of our society that we give voice to the suffering, expose the prevalent evils in our world, and let these stories be heard. To all of the leftist and CCP sympathizers on this campus who relentlessly, who relentlessly tore down our flyers, defaced our posters, and protested, I want you to know that you failed today to stop this event, and you will always continually fail in your effort to silence voices and the prevention of free speech. And to our friends, Thank you so much who are joining us via live stream and also here in person. Let's give our brave speakers a warm welcome and kick off this event with Mr. James Gorey, who will dive right into the topic of communism and the torture that the Chinese people experienced. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight on this good Friday evening. This event couldn't be more relevant than it is right now. But before I begin, I'd first like to thank David Chan and the Berkeley College Republicans for putting on this event, a very important event, here at UC Berkeley in the, the eye of the storm, as it were, of uh, whatever Berkeley has become. Um, my thanks also go out to the Epic Times, for which I'm a contributor at their China desk, um, for not only promoting this event, but live streaming it as well. The Epic Times is an island of moral clarity and a sea of confusion, it, it would appear. As David mentioned, my name is James Gorey. I wrote a book called The China Crisis about 12 years ago. And uh, in addition to the Epic Times, you can find my articles, interviews, books, and so forth at my blog, thebananarepublican.com. So this evening, you're going to hear from these extraordinarily brave people who have personally seen and suffered persecution at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, also known as the CCP. Now, my brief talk will address one simple question. Why is it that the Marxist political systems of the world, and tonight we're talking about the CCP, so consistently end up torturing, imprisoning, and murdering millions, if not tens of millions, of their own people? The answer may surprise you. It's simple, but it's not one you may have heard of. Uh, first, to get there, we'll take a brief look at the toll that communism has brought humanity. And then we'll take a look at who Karl Marx really was and what he was really all about, what he believed, and why, therefore, at its root, Marxism is not all about materialism and atheism and things like that. That's part of it, but... Rather, we'll see how Marx's deep religious beliefs, that may be a surprise to some, are the key to understanding communism and its mission in the world. And finally, we'll see that big reason why the CCP continues to commit the atrocities and purges it does against its own people on an industrial scale. So even a brief tour of communism's death toll is, is quite dreary. Three million in the Russian Revolution, uh, maybe 100 million of the first 100 years of communism between 1900 or 1917 and 2017. Uh, Stalin's purges, the mass starvation of Ukrainians in the 30s, which, by the way, was the first, quote, genocide by starvation, unquote, in all of human history, brought to you by the Communist Party. Um, of course, there are many millions more who published, excuse me, who perished in the uh, Soviet gulags, and then China, who followed, which followed uh, Soviet Russia's example, 
Mao Zedong's long march to communism led to the deaths of up to 30 million Chinese, or perhaps more. The accounting is just, it's just not possible. Many more died in prison camps, the, the comparative gulags in, the, in China, and um, in particular, from 1958 to 1962, Mao's so-called Great Leap Forward led to the deaths of tens of millions more Chinese who were, again, starved to death. So there's all kinds of calculations, conservative and, and not so conservative, but it's been estimated that by a recent uh, CCP official, former CCP official rather, that uh, up to 80 million people died under Mao. And uh, by comparison, even small countries such as Cambodia in the mid-1970s uh, suffered greatly as well. Pol Pot's regime killed about two million people, one quarter of the population in just four years. So there really is no shortage of information. Marxist regimes are actually killing machines. They kill societies. Um, but the CCP outperforms them all. The Chinese Communist Party has killed more human beings than any other single nation or regime on earth in the history of the world. But again, why? What is it that makes some human beings capable of such horrific crimes? And how do the CCP members themselves justify their actions? Is it all about materialism, atheism, or both? Sure, they're both certainly part of CCP doctrine, but as we know, materialism, which basically is the idea of everything in the world and the universe being made up of only matter um, and chemicals and so forth. That would include human beings. We know that's, that's a big premise. Um, that leaves us with no spirit, no soul, no God, no creator, and <clears throat> certainly nothing that it would exist beyond this life. So obviously it's no surprise that materialism leads to atheism and atheism supports materialism kind of they kind of lead you to the same place. And of course, both, both of these in the CCP are validated by science, which in turn is used to support the worldview of the CCP and the, you know, and the Chinese Communist Party, rather. And the CCP uh, likes to call it scientific socialism, and they publish books about that kind of thing. But all that still doesn't really explain why the CCP kills so many of its own people. If atheism or materialism were the answer, then Sweden, which is one of the most atheist nations on earth, would have a similar kill rate to China or other communist states. But of course, <laughs> it doesn't. Certainly, many who call themselves Marxists today, from the CCP members to the founders of Black Lives Matter to legions of university professors, they all believe that materialism and atheism are not only central to Marxism, but are what best describe our reality. But what they don't know or don't acknowledge is the full story about Karl Marx himself. Because although that's part of his doctrine, neither are the real true part of Karl Marx's internal identity, nor how he regarded himself, his own humanity, or his true mission in life as he saw it. The truth is, Karl Marx was not an atheist. Very far from it. Not, uh, nor he was he a strict materialist. He actually worshipped a god, and a very well-known one at that. But Marx knew that all human beings have a deep need to believe in something greater than themselves. He knew that. The, and of course, the legacy and persistence of world religions across recorded history point to that very obvious fact. So too, as C.S. Lewis would put it, does our sense of morality, right and wrong, and other foundations of civilization. So here in the West, for the past 2,000 years, it's been Christianity and the Bible that has fulfilled that basic human need. But Marx, who was intimately familiar with both the, the Old and New Testaments, had his goal as to the elimination of both biblical premises and the societies found upon it. In fact, he wanted to find, it was his point in life, to, to replace them both with a different religion, an anti-religion, an anti-God religion, if you will, but still a religion nonetheless. But Marx knew to do that, he would have to create a suitable replacement. And uh, communism uh, was and remains that new religion, and the Communist Manifesto, Das Kapital, and all the other writings were his so-called Bible. 
So that's where it was. And the thing is, he wasn't even very original with it. Um, he simply stole, or to use the politically correct term, appropriated the Judeo-Christian template in the Bible and inserted his own terminology into that template. French philosopher Raymond Aron pointed this out in his brilliant book on Marxism called The Opium of, the Opium of the Intellectuals, where even a brief comparison makes Marx's grand theft quite obvious. In the Bible, for instance, the Jews are God's chosen people. Marx simply replaces them with the proletariat as the chosen people. In the Old Testament, God sends Moses to deliver the law and lead his people in, into the promised land. And Marx makes himself Moses, delivers the law via his manifesto, and promises a worker's paradise. Furthermore, God and his divine providence are replaced by history with a capital H and Hegel's dialectical materialism. And along the way, the church is replaced by the Communist Party. You get the idea. It's, it's all very Judeo-Christian in his structure and eschatology, and for one very good reason. In his early years, Karl Marx was a confirmed Christian. Born in Trier, Prussia in 1818, his given name was Moses Mordecai Levy, son of a Jewish rabbi who, a few years after Marx was born, converted to Christianity. Now, the reasons vary why he may have done that, from economic or social needs to even religious ones, but it had a profound impact on young Karl Marx. But what does that interesting bit of biography have to do with the Communist Party and the CCP? Quite a bit, actually. Marx, as you may know, was brilliant on many levels. An accomplished lawyer, he's a tremendous writer, insightful political economist, an unparalleled sociologist, and much more. But he was also a poet. He was a poet for his entire life. And this is where this brief discussion takes just a slightly deeper metaphysical and spiritual turn. Because that's exactly what happened to Marx himself as a young man. It is in his poetry where we find the internal man of Marx, the true person that he became and the ideas that he committed to. Marx expressed his thoughts and intentions in his poetry with a undeniable depth of passion and cataloging his spiritual struggles with who else but God. Ultimately, as the following quotes will indicate, Marx did not deny the existence of God. But he did express his rebellion against him. And in his poem, The Pale Maiden, Marx wrote, for example, quote, thus, thus heaven I forfeited, I know it full well, my soul, once true to God, is chosen for hell, unquote. Hardly the words of an atheist. The clarity of Marx's poetic expression shows us the truth and the extent of that rebellion. He not only rejected God, uh, like uh, Dostoevsky's Ivan Karamazov, but in that rejection, he embraced God's adversary, whom Marx explicitly names in his poem, The Fiddler. Quote, with Satan, I have struck my deal. He chalks the signs, beats time for me. I play the death march fast and free, unquote. So really, there's no mistake. It's very biblical. All the main players are there. God, the devil, the whole thing. Uh, Marx was no atheist. He, he actually had an actual spiritual life, if you will call it that, and his own rituals and so forth. Um, he simply changed his alliance from God to God's adversary. Now, this may be hard to accept for Marxists today, particularly for the more sophisticated intellectual class, but uh, for Marx, his allegiance to Satan and to the destruction of Western Christian society, in fact, all human societies, was at the core of his being. Again, those aren't my words, those are his, as he writes in his poem, Human Pride. Quote, like unto a god, I dare, through that ruined realm in triumph roam. Every word is deed and fire, and my bosom like the maker's own. Unquote. Again, these poetic confessions, and he, he wrote quite a lot of them throughout his life, um, contradict the entire cause, premise, and stated objectives of his Communist Manifesto, i.e., they contradict the, the promise of a worker's paradise, of equity, equality, and, and all those things. In other words, Marx's goal for global communism wasn't to reform society, wasn't to edify it, but to destroy it. 
and it's, uh, complete, it bring complete destruction to it. Again, Marx's words, quote, I long to take vengeance on the one who rules from above, unquote. So what do these deep and, and quite dark spiritual beliefs mean for class struggle, the proletariat, and all the other pretensions that he wrote about? Firstly, they're a means to an end. They're actually a, a trope, a seduction to deceive mankind by appealing to our intellect or more precisely to our intellectual pride. Secondly, communism and its religious template tries to fill the human need to be a part of something bigger than oneself that transcends time and promises a bright future. Very religious. And they do so to a degree, but in a clever but very inhumane way. And they bring out, Marx brings out and affirms the very worst in humanity by reducing human beings to units of production and other materialistic and economic terms. All the while packaging it in attractive materialistic pretensions such as scientific socialism and intellectual atheism. But all for the enthusiastic consumption by self-regarding intelligentsia and romantic revolutionaries. And they've been swallowing that vile confection for more than a century. Which brings us today's, to today's Chinese Communist Party. Just this past February at the Winter Olympic Games in Beijing, the CCP made a big deal of promoting its latest book, The Principles of Scientific Atheism, ostensibly because, well, the party must have felt the need to do so. A few questions come to mind. Why does the CCP feel the need to promote a new book on atheism? Has some new fact come to light? Does God not exist even more now? Or perhaps it's to persuade the people, particularly CCP members, that their only hope remains with the party. Or it could be to reinforce the idea of zero accountability for the atrocities that they're committing even to this day. And consequently, why is the CCP purging itself again while promoting community prosperity? It seems quite contradictory. Well, according to former U.S. National Security Advisor Zbigniew Brzezinski, quote, all communist regimes rely on purges the terrorizing, jailing, and killing of large numbers of people in order to maintain na uh, doctrinal purity. Now, unquote. The reality is that's a euphemism. It's a way to place blame for the party's great failures um, and its ongoing destruction of society on the newly dead and those who are about to be. And so, so society continues to crumble, just as Marx intended with the Communist Manifesto. How do we know this about China? For more than a decade, China's internal security budget has surpassed its entire defense budget. So what exactly is the CCP afraid of? The party fears the people. What's more, it fears the people's belief in something other than the party, God. Christianity, Falun Gong, Buddhism, any spiritual belief that elevates mankind, that elevates the individual, reveals the party for the monstrous fraud that it truly is, and thereby threatens its very existence. Communism is designed and intended to fail. It's intended to bring about destruction wherever it is instituted. Ironically, the same force that China is pushing against right now, is it's also desperately trying to copy. Like Marx and Mao, Xi Jinping is persecuting Christians even as he tries to appropriate it. Why else would he replace the Ten Commandments with the Ten G quotes? Why else would he replace Jesus Christ's image with his own? Like Marx, Xi is rather desperate to take vengeance upon, quote, the one who rules from above, unquote. Sadly, today as the CCP continues its atrocities against its own people, it is well down the path of Marx's desired goal for destruction of human society and tragically millions upon millions of souls are enduring great suffering because of it. Some of them are with us tonight. 
Thank you. Um, please join me in welcoming Ms. Gung, who will now speak, um, the, be the first to speak in quite personal terms of the dimensions of her own experiences at the hands of the CCP. Thank you. 因为近二十年了他也曾经三次获得诺尔贝尔和平奖提名应该也是在就是说现在火热的人当中呢也是提名最多的就是这样子的一个人呢但是被中共定性为了是头号政治犯我先生原本是一名普通的律师一名虔诚的基督徒他用他自己的职业为受迫害的人代理案子比如像群体信仰案子像法轮功呀基督徒呀还有群体的那种拆迁呀上访人代理案子的时候呢屡屡遭到北京市律师协会及司法局的警告和阻止由于他坚守阁
。二零零八年呢，警察呢就是不允许，不允许我两个未成年的孩子上学，用这种方式来给我先生施压，迫使他屈服。没有办法呢，我在二零零九年呢就携带一双未成年的儿女，呃，为了为了孩子的求学，踏上了求学之路，呃，也是一种也是一种也是一种逃难之路吧。嗯，我们经过越南、缅甸，九死一生的偷渡到了泰国，然后辗转到了美国，至今已经十三年了。这十三年来，我没有见过我的先生。孩子没有见过爸爸，我没有电话，没有视频，我们不知道在哪里，我们甚至不知道他是死是活。你们相信吗？在美国避难的我们，我的丈夫，在中国不是监狱就是酷刑就是软禁，一家人分离在地球的两端。尽管科技网络如此发达的今天，今年五十五岁的我，我们家仅有一张儿子两岁时的全家福。我相信在座的各位，每个人手里都有智能手机，每个人都有无数心爱的人的照片。不管你们身在哪里，在家里，在办公室里。在旅途中，不管你们在世界任何的一个地方，你们随时可以翻看你们父母、孩子、亲人的照片及视频，而这种温馨的场景，不属于我的家庭，对我们来说是一种奢望。已经十三年，很抱歉，嗯。每天清晨起来，我都期待着奇迹能发生。我会习惯性的翻看我的手机，看一看有没有我的，看看有没有我先生新的消息。当每当每当寻找他这个消息的时候呢，我会被一种无尽的、说不清的情绪淹没自己，就像废气炸了，身体有许多那种气泡。穿着往上涌，直到肩上。其实呢，我就一直就调整着自己，让自己的呼吸慢一些，再慢一些。数着他失踪的日子：一千七百零三天，一千七百零四天，一千七百零五天。今天，今天四月十五号。是他被强制失踪一千七百零六天，思念和揪心的煎熬，吞噬着我的生命，这也是我一天的开始。和我同样被煎熬的，还有我先生的家人，他的姐姐，因无法忍受中共、中共公安长期的骚扰和压迫。担心弟弟的，担心弟弟的安危，与二零零五，担心弟弟的安危，呃，忧郁沉寂。在二零二零二零年五月，在是二零二零二零年五月跳河自尽，在生命的尽头也没有看到牵挂的弟弟。和我同样煎熬的还有我的家人们。中共当局呢？他限制我的家人寻找我的先生，没收了所有的人身份证。像在病重，尤其是呃，我的姐夫在身患病重的时候，取药的时候呢，他们都刁难，嗯，不给返还身份证，因此呢，造成了救治困难。二零一六年的五月，我病重的姐夫跳楼自杀。中共直接从我的家家族里面夺去了两条人的性命，给我这个破碎的家庭又是重重的一击。尽管我来到了美国，有了人生的安全和自由，但孩子心理上却蒙受着挥之不去的阴影。在缺失父爱成长的孩子，没有人能替代父亲引领他们成长。
成长过程中的重要时刻，比如像在学校，无论是小学、初中、高中，没有分享，没有父亲分享他们的喜悦，毕业典礼上，孩子们感受到的，就是父亲的空缺，孩子们的焦虑，让我忧心无比。现在儿子又到了他人生重要的转折点，再次的感恩。我在这里，我在这里，著名的世界，著名的伯克利大学与你们这些天之骄子、社会的佼佼者交流，期待着你们的引领，能使我的孩子避免少走一些弯路。高志胜的苦难，我们家庭的苦难，目前还没有到头。在中国，像我们这样子的家庭的迫害还很多。呃，我希望大家关注高智生，关注中国的人权命运。谢谢，谢谢大家。谢谢谢谢。It's my great,、uh, it's a great honor and a privilege. Uh, to share my testimony with, you know,、uh, students and professors, teachers at this great university, and I feel it's also my responsibility to speak for Mr. Gao Zhisheng. It was、um, 2006. I read some writings on a website posted by American Chinese pastors on an online forum. At that time, that was the unique and the comparatively free forum, forum for sensitive topics, including culture, history, religion, and even politics. Some posts about attorney, lawyer, law issues, and Christianity in China aroused my interest by chance. Just like I was, one of my child dream was to be a lawyer or attorney, but I give up, cause I found no justice in China. Of which, one of the threads enlightened me profoundly. It was about attorney Gao Zhisheng and his assistance for those people in a in disadvantaged situation. His thoughts and the faith of Christ began to nourish my emotion for love and aversion for justice, and furthermore, to answer my long existing puzzles about human humanity. And this enlightenment inspired me to explore the Christianity circle on the website. I was intrigued by what Attorney Gao. Had been doing for years. Mr. Gao Zhisheng, as a Christian and attorney, came to prominence through his advocacy of Falun Gong practitioners and individuals oppressed for their religion or land seizures, seizures, seizures. His defense of、uh, Falun Gong, who had been forcefully harvested their physical organs. Reminded me of the sudden disappearance of some very good people that I knew back in 1999 at my university. They are my professors, they are my classmates. Because they were allegedly called evil cult, Falun Gong practitioners. And、I、never came back again. At that time, I don't know. I didn't know why. I came to find out the truth about Falun Gong practitioners via the VPN software, Freegate. In particular, I read the nine commentaries on the Communist Party, which is a final verdict on the China Communist Party and its crimes against humanity. Instantly, I understood Attorney Gao Zhisheng. 
This ideation has greatly influenced on my teaching as a teacher. I realized it was almost impossible to protect the righteousness through legal system, and I insisted deliver the truth and the justice to my students. I introduced to my students about Gao Zhisheng and what I knew about Falun Gong. As I thought my students had the privilege to know the truth, just like me, I criticized the brutal torture on the loving and religious people imposed by the Communist Party and its government. I encouraged my students to explore the different opinions in the English-speaking world through reading real books, exploring the real internet, asking questions, and even questioning their teachers, for I knew they needed to explore and experience the conflicts themselves, like me myself. Loving people like Mr. Gao Zhisheng has helped thousands of disadvantaged minorities, and most importantly, inspired many who are looking for justice and freedom, like me. This probably is apparently the major reason that China Communist Party and its government has been trying so hard to detain and torture him in such a brutal manner. More than ten years, Mr. Gao has been tormented, abducted, and imprisoned with most of his teeth miserably shed. I know he has been in, in the bitterness beyond any imagination. Prominent Christian attorney Gao Zhisheng has been kidnapped again by China's government for more than four years again, with no due process of law. I urge that prisoners of conscience like Gao Zhisheng be freed this instant before merciful trials of those persecutors being carried out sooner or later. Those in power can shatter Mr. Gao's family defile his name, kill his body. Yet, no one on this earth can possibly deprive of his faith in love, justice, and his everlasting inspirations to his beloved people in China. Thank you. Hello 拍摄新疆乌鲁木齐街头十三张照片发到境外博讯网站上以及接受一些外媒采访等就被中国政府以煽动颠覆国家政权罪后进外刺探非法提供情报罪判处有期徒刑十九年他的这些言论抨击了中
而遭拘禁讯问，无数次协助访民，把他们遭遇中国政府的不公发布到网上等等，给予以上长期的言行，引起中国当局强烈的不满和仇视，加上他被抓捕后举步认罪。中国当局以重判一个说真话的普通人，以达到威吓新疆人乃至整个中国人的目的。他在看守所被戴沉重脚镣，用手铐反吊着打，连续二十天日夜不让睡觉，不准闭眼。如困了，就用打火机的火在他的头前后左右点着烧，长时间不给饭吃。经常不让吃饱等。二审开庭前夕，律师给他捎去二审法官的话，说：“如果你认罪，就可减去一半的刑期。”他断然拒绝。张海涛平静地说：“共产党的话，你能信吗？”二审刘律师说：“凭他二十多年的职业生涯及阅人无数的经验判断，此君必定是一个有信仰的人。”便问其有无信仰，其告是一个基督徒，信仰上帝。张海涛目前被关押在距离乌里木齐约一千一百公里的塔克拉玛干沙漠腹地的沙雅监狱，迄今只被允许三次家属会见。二零一八年四月二十六日，最后一次得以会见，还源于傅西秋牧师。带领我和儿子到美国华府寻求国际救助，海涛姐姐才有机会见到他的弟弟。海涛姐姐说：“我问弟弟几个人一个监视，他说就他一个人。问他能出来活动吗？他说原来有一个门，后来门被封了。这再次证实我前两次探视他时，他所遭受的酷刑与虐待。他被单独关押，不让放风。”因为我把监狱的黑暗曝光出来，为我的丈夫维权发声，我遭到了我的哥哥哥姐姐们的暴打，他们逼迫我离开我的先生，禁止我在网上发表言论，他们把我打得鼻青脸肿，浑身淤青，我的一个哥哥掐住我的脖子，让我几乎窒息，我挣扎着喊：“上帝阿巴夫神救我！”哥哥才终于罢手。当天，派出所的警车不断光顾哥哥的家，他们以哥哥们的工作为要挟。我深知，平时爱我的哥哥姐姐，如果不这样做，就无法向政府交差。仅差十一天，就整整四年了，一千四百四十九天，中国当局一直不允许家属会见张海涛。我们在去年。一月收到过他一封信，一年三个多月，音讯全无，无数次的思念和担忧，化作一个个噩梦。张海涛被酷刑，那鲜血淋漓的场景令我从梦中哭醒，多少次夜深人静，孩子睡着，忍不住失声痛哭。最近家人和狱方联系，说因为疫情不允许家属会见。我们要求和张海涛有一个通话，得到的答复是张海涛本人不愿意给家人写信和通电话。我的心在滴血的痛。张海涛，你现在到底怎么样了？我们的儿子慕田，名字是自由的意思，小名小曼德拉，语义争取人权的意思，都是他爸爸起的名字。这个孩子已经六岁了。从出生到现在，从未见过他的爸爸。他画了一个爸爸抱着他的图画，但是多么渴望得到爸爸的拥抱啊！可是成一个简单的愿望，就变成了一个奢望。张海涛是无罪的，他应该得到自由和释放。而不是等到他六十三岁，白发苍苍，刑满出狱，不敢想象，也无法想象。长夜漫漫，天总会亮，随时会亮。这是张海涛信中的一句话，也是他的期盼
。如果每个人对这种践踏人权的行径保持沉默，我们每个人都将陷入着黑夜、绝望之中，被黑暗所吞噬。让我们一起对这种践踏人权的行径说不吧！感谢上帝的恩典，感谢所有帮助我们。把我们从黑暗泥潭中拔出，放在自由光明之地的组织和个人。如果没有你们，我也没有机会站在这里。我也再次恳请各位关注张海涛，关注中国的人权状况，帮助这对父子能够在有生之年相聚拥抱。让我们一家人早日团聚，也让更多像我们这样的家庭早日团聚。再次感谢大家。嗯，大家好，我叫方正。嗯，今天在这里，很荣幸和我两位尊敬的女士，耿和女士和李爱杰女士，我们都是很熟悉的。刚刚听了他们的故事，我真的非常感慨。确实，大家都知道中共有很多的暴行，但是我们需要更多的人像这两位勇敢的女士一样，把他们的家人所遭受中共暴行的这些真相告诉大家。希望大家能够更多了解中共的罪行。嗯，今天是一个啊，好，谢。So I'll be translating for Mr. Fang Zheng. Hello, my name is Fang Zheng. It's an honor to be here with two of the people who I respect the most,、um, Ms. Li Aijian and Ms. Geng He. I'm very touched, and I find it very inspiring to be listening to their story today. And we need more people like them who bravely step up and tell people about the evils that are happening in China. Today, this is a very special day. It's May 15th. You may have heard of it. 三十三三十三年前，一九八九年的四月十五号，从这一天开始，在中国，在北京，开始了一个举世瞩目的全中国的一个民主运动。那么，在那个时候，我作为北京的一个大学生，参与了从四月十五号开始到六月四号这个镇压的在中国的这个民主运动。我当时是北京的一个大学生。Today is April 15th. It is a very special day to me. Just 33 years ago, I was a university student at Beijing, and during April 15, 1989 to June 4th, 1989, the the student democracy movement had just kickstarted, and I was at Beijing at the time. 大家都知道。六六四的惨案，一九八九年六月四号那一天，中共用他的机枪和坦克，残酷的镇压了这场民主爱国运动。As we probably all know, on June fourth, nineteen the CCP had launched a brutal campaign against the students who were fighting for democracy. The CCP had used its machine guns and tanks. To swipe against the innocent students. People are very proud of the famous tank man's photo. This photo is a brave man who fought to defend the tanks that surrounded the students. It represents the courage of the people who fought to defend the tanks. We probably are familiar with this photo of the tank man. He is a symbol of people stand up. Standing up against the oppression of the CCP. But I hope more people will know the truth about the tanks and the tanks that lost their lives. Because on that day, in China, in Beijing, in Tiananmen, in Changanjie, there were many people who died from the tanks and the tanks. My right hand was in Changanjie, in the tanks and the tanks that were lost by the tanks. I want more people to know about the truth of people who died. More people to know about the truth of people who die under those tanks、um, in Beijing in the Chang'an Street. So many students die. My legs、um, were. I lost my legs there on Chang'an Street from the tank running it, running them over. So, 
。三十三年过去了，那场残酷镇压的真相，人们其实并不是知道太多，因为我们知道，中共一贯以来就是在他的这种暴行之后，就是用谎言去掩盖事实，去掩盖真相。It's been 33 years, but people know so little about the Tiananmen massacre, and that is because the CCP has habitually erased history with lies after violence. 就我个人的一个经历就是，其实在我被坦克从身后追杀之后，中共的当局竟然无耻的要求我这个。受害者，一个亲自亲身的经历者，让我去说，我不是坦克被压的，说让我说成是其他的车祸，以此想来掩盖中共坦克压人的这个事实。Do you know how ridiculous it is that the CCP actually asked me after I've been hunted down by the tank and hurt from hurt severely from it, they asked me to sign a contract saying that my legs weren't hurt by the tanks. 但是我认为，坚持真相、坚持事实是一个做人的最起码的一个要求。但是在中国，一个坚持真相的人是要付出代价的。所以我在中国，在直至二零零九年流亡美国之前的二十年，也是付出了很多的代价，两次被中共抓捕。啊，我热爱的残疾人体育事业也是因为此被中共给取消各种比赛。And I think it's very important to speak up, to have the integrity and speak up for the truth. But in China, that would mean you are risking everything. You're risking your lives. And I was, I was twice, I was twice arrested by the Chinese Communist Party for my speaking up. And、um, I was very. I was actively engaged in the Paralympics at the time, and that was forcibly put to an end by the Chinese Communist Party. China is so doing, actually, it knows its crime. It is very afraid of letting people know. They are the most afraid of the truth. The CCP does this because it is afraid of the truth. This regime is so afraid of people knowing the truth. So I am here to say. 国内的像高志胜律师、像张海涛先生这样，这种勇于在中共、在中共的政权下，勇于揭露中共政权、维持真相的这些人士，我对他们真正表示特别崇高的一种敬意。所以，他们因此也付出了个人惨重的、惨重的代价。Hereby, I want to pass my、um, most sincere gratitude and、um, deepest respect for people like. Uh, Mr. Gao Zhisheng and Mr. Zhang Haitao, who are in China, but they they fiercely spoke up for the truth and paid a very heavy price for it. So, in here, I hope everyone will seek more truth. We must ask the corrupt regime. We hope that China can quickly be stopped from being destroyed by the Chinese Communist Party. This is something we all need to work together. 只有这样，才不会有这么多悲剧在继续。我们才能知道高志胜到底在哪里，张海涛到底遭受了哪些罪、哪些的酷刑。所以，希望大家能够和我们一起去追寻真真相，早日结束中共的暴政。谢谢大家。So, I will encourage everyone here to hunt for the truth, um, to hunt for the truth and. Um, because that is the way to end the CCP's atrocities, so that we can know where is Mr. Gao Zhisheng and where is Mr. Zhang Haitao, and yeah, I encourage people to to stand up to get to know the truth. Thank you, everyone. My name is Bob Fu. I'm the founder and president of China Aid, a nonprofit international NGO dedicated for religious freedom for all. 
and rule of law in China. I was born and raised in China. My mother was a survivor of Chairman Mao's great leap forward under which from 1958 to 62, at least 20 million Chinese people died. I want to thank the Berkeley College Republican for the courage to host tonight's event. Thanks for the leadership, Amanda and David, against all the odds. This topic about the atrocities of the CCP is very timely. It is not and should not be a partisan topic, not a right or left topic, because it involves the humanity for those who are still doubting about the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and the reality of the atrocities. Just after hearing the testimonies, the stories of Ms. Gong He, Ms. Li Aijie, and Mr. Fang Zhong, how can we deny that? As James just elaborated, at least 80 million people were killed, murdered, died out of unnatural death in the past 70 years under the CCP's brutal rule. That's more than what Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler has killed, even combined together. I just came back from, I mean, just uh, flew from Washington, D.C. yesterday after hosting with the victims of the Communism Foundation a press conference welcoming our newly rescued the first Kyrgyz ethnic uh, Christian family from Xinjiang, Mr. Overbeck Tudakwen, his family. On Wednesday, nearby the White House, Mr. Overlack, who is a trained lawyer, shared his story about what happened to him. For 10 months, he was put in the one concentration camp in 2018. put in the tiger chair, being fed with unknown pills, forced injection of unknown liquid into his body. He I witnessed in that one cell of the concentration camp, 34 people, most of them, of course, ethnic Uyghurs, some are Kyrgyz, some are Kazakh ethnicities. They were treated like that. In order to even go out of that one prison cell, of that concentration camp to the yard, he has to go through 13 different doors, all with military, like guns, some with, he's observed, with gasoline gun. Sometimes they were put in a small, tiny cell, only can hold one person, no window at all. So ladies and gentlemen, the Communist Party and Xi Jinping himself has committed genocide 
according to the Pentagon's estimate, between one to three million people, primarily in Xinjiang, had been put into over 380 concentration camps in today's China, in Xinjiang. Let's take, see the picture, next picture. So in churches, in temples, in mosques, this is in today's China. You have those who are allowed to exist, they have to put a terminal's photo, and terminal Xi Jinping's photo on both sides of a little cross on the stage on the sanctuary of the church, in a mosque, in a Tibetan Buddhist temple. This is called sanitization. Sanitization of religion, which means any religion, any faith who is found not compatible with the socialism, with the communism ideology, has to be treated like the, this way, has to be destroyed. Thousands of Chinese, the crosses, were, has become enemy of the state, uh, being ordered to be taken down, or being forcefully demolished, or burned. And in the past few years, under this slogan of sanitization, Zhongguo Hua, Millions of Chinese children, Christian children, were forced to renounce their faith by signing a Communist Party prepared form in front of the public. Otherwise, their teachers will be punished. Their parents, grandparents, would lose their social welfare. So today is Good Friday. Good Friday. So we know what Jesus Christ has done. It is the suffering. It is, of course, the crucifixion. And now, really, literally, all the independent faith and the Chinese faithful are suffering this kind of uh, brutality atrocity. Last February, China Aid, we rescued a family from Xinjiang. That's our first rescue from the, the family from uh, the concentration camp. This young uh, Kazakh Muslim lady, Guzira, she spent nearly two years in several concentration camps. She shared with us, not only herself was brutally raped in the concentration camp, but she was forced by the concentration guards to handcuff. And then this young, beautiful ladies in the concentration camp, in a dark room, locked them down on a bed, and then she was forced to go out, and then men were being arranged, walk into this room, and when she heard this man was shouting to the crying, screaming ladies, said, we paid for this, in Mandarin Chinese, she realized this is the government orchestrated systematic prostitution against these young women in the concentration camps. And she herself was suffered so much after we rescued her to West Texas, or Midland, Texas, that's where our headquarters is. Almost, I couldn't remember how many nights and days even midnight, we got a phone call. My staff got a phone call. I got a phone call to where she was sleeping with her 
five-year-old daughter and her husband. We saw, I saw with my own eyes, she was scrambled under the, her bed. Said she was painful. She was uh, full of pain. We sent her to the ER multiple times. Could not detect where the pain is. She just, uh, I think, I mean, basically, being fed and injected with too much of this uh, unknown medication. She did not. She could not find out. If you don't call it atrocity, if you don't call genocide, then what it is? And when the Communist Party would be held accountable, the next slides. I just want to share two quick stories. This pastor Wang Yi and his wife. He was a trained lawyer in 2005. He and other 14 Chinese human rights defenders were named as the Person of the Year by the Asian Newsweek. And then he became an underground church pastor called Early Rain Covenant Church. Just because he preached a sermon based on John 3:16, said God so loved the world, and then. He called for President Xi to repent and give him the opportunity of salvation, and then he was arrested and sentenced to nine years and being accused of、uh, as the instigation of the subversion of state power. His wife was arrested, so I mean, over two, at least two hundred of members of his church. And among them, at least 80 of the women were being abused, were being tortured, including his wife, Miss Jiang Rong. Next one, Pastor John Hall, a Chinese American pastor, a close friend of mine, who could live his a good、uh, life with his American dream. He came to the U.S. Thirty some plus years ago, and married with a Caucasian American wife, Jamie Powell from North in North Carolina, pastoring a big Chinese church in the Triangle area in Raleigh Durham. But he could not give up his mission dream to take care of both the poor, the needy, and the vulnerable in China. So he made a contract with his church that I need to spend at least half a year in China to help spread the gospel, to help the Chinese people. And then, a couple years ago, a few years ago, he set up 16 schools for 2,000 children by mobilizing the American church, Chinese church, in the Burma-China border areas. For the, this、uh, persecuted group called Kachin Group, the Burmese military had committed genocide against that ethnic minority group. So when he saw that, he just wanted to help these two thousand children by setting up sixteen schools, and then Communist Party、uh, lured him back to China on the border area and sentenced him. Seven years imprisonment. Seven years imprisonment. Ladies and gentlemen, as、uh, the former U.S. ambassador, Senator Sam Brownback, call it, Xi Jinping has launched a war against faith, all independent faith, Christian faith, Catholic faith, Falun Gong faith. Tibetan Buddhist faith. Any faith has a spirit of independence. He declared war. Good luck. A war against God. He's not the first one. Tried. We have seen the pharaohs in Egypt. Not only tried once, ten times. Right. 
We have seen Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian powerful king, maybe more powerful with more wealth than Communist Party has. What had happened to them? The Pharaoh's army were buried right under the sea, Red Sea. The Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, became an animal, ate grass. And what had happened to his predecessors, Chairman Mao, who had tried to, during the, before the Cultural Revolution, Chairman Mao basically, and his wife, Madam Jiang Qing, after burning hundreds of thousands of copies of Bibles at the Shanghai Public Revolutionary Square in 1967, she declared, she said, from today's on, Christianity will forever belong to the History Museum of China. And guess what? Ten years later, she was arrested. Another ten years, I guess, I think, she hanged herself in her prison. But in 1976 or 1980, barely ten years after the Cultural Revolution, when Chairman Mao declared an atheist state, the number of Chinese Christians tripled from 3 million Christians in 1966, when the Cultural Revolution was announced, to 9 million Christians. I think Xi Jinping has not read, maybe he's not a, even a literate, educated, uh, any history lesson. This is what Pastor John Hall wrote from his prison. We, he smuggled, we smuggled out some poems. This is what Pastor John Hall wrote. He said, you can take away my freedom, but you can't take my prayers. My prayers have wings and leaps over the iron mesh high wall. Many brothers and sisters have heard them. And they fly freely every day and reach the heaven on the blue sky. You can impose heavy punishment on me, but you can't hold my soul and spirit. It is like a joyful yellow bird gently prays to the iron gate. My Savior must have heard my voice. At this Good Friday Easter weekend, may the Spirit of Christ, His resurrection, continue to encourage not only those who are still suffering the atrocity, like Gao Zhishong, like Zhang Haitao, like millions of others, prisoner of conscience. But those of us in the free world, take courage, be a voice for those voiceless. So once again, I thank the, the, the Berkeley, you know, you know the, this uh, uh, brief Berkeley College Republican uh, Students Association for giving us opportunity to speak up. Thank you. Thank you. My name, my name is Ming Hui. I'm an undergraduate student here at Cal, just like many of you sitting here today. I would like to share my family's story with you all as a survivor of communism. My parents and I practice Falun Dafa, also called Falun Gong, a peaceful spiritual belief that focuses on the improvement of mind and body. Our master, the founder of Falun Dafa, teaches us to use the principles of, of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance to guide our everyday lives. Through reading the Falun Dafa books, I learn to treat others with kindness, even when it's not reciprocated. I learn to see conflicts as opportunities to improve myself, even if I don't seem to be at fault. And I also learn to be more empathetic and to always consider situations from someone else's perspective, 
and there are so many other wonderful things I learned from the practice. But when I was in China, I did not dare to tell anyone about this. Ever since July 1999, the year before I was born, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, had issued an order to eradicate Falun Gong. It destroyed books and materials, used all of its state media as propaganda machines to slander Falun Gong. And it persecuted the innocent practitioners who simply wanted to adhere to the, to the faith that they had benefited from tremendously. But that was not allowed. Over the past 23 years, several millions were imprisoned, and the amount of which many were tortured or even killed. In 2006, the world was shocked to learn that many Falun Gong practitioners were killed on demand for their organs. I wish I had seen what China was like before the persecution began. My parents told me every morning the city parks were filled with Falun Gong exercise sites of varying sizes. People would show up to do the gentle exercises and meditation, clean up the area afterwards and head to work. My parents told me they met some of their closest friends there. They were of different occupations and different ages, many of whom I would later meet. And they were among the kindest, bravest and most selfless people I know. But as soon as the crackdown started, life had turned upside down. Unable to sit still through the overwhelming news about the people around them getting imprisoned for their faith. My parents brought train tickets to Beijing, hoping to appeal to the officials and tell them about the truth. But they were arrested before they even reached the appeals office. My mom was eight months pregnant with me at the time. So she was released after a few days, but my father was illegally detained for way longer. After I was born, my parents had to go into exile to a small city in southern China where the local authorities did not know there were Falun Gong practitioners. But that was not a long-term solution after all. As an absolute last resort, they left me with my grandparents in my dad's hometown in central China shortly after I turned one so I could at least temporarily have a stable life. My father came to pick me up when I was five. I did not know who he was, and I did not want to leave with him. We returned to Guangzhou, where my mother was illegally imprisoned in a brainwashing camp, or so-called re-education center. As far back as my memory goes, that was the first time I've seen my mother. She was cuffed to a chair with a very thick plastic tube inserted into her nose. And several people were right next to her guarding her. She was in the process of being force fed liquids that had an unbearable smell. She was clearly in excruciating pain and was terrified. I remember crying and not wanting to approach her. I knew I have a mother, but I could not believe this was the person I've dreamed so many times about. What is happening to her? Many years later, I learned that she had just gone on a hunger strike <clears throat> for more than 40 days. So the officials in the center decided to force fed her as a way to keep her alive while putting her in even more pain. In fact, she told me many years later that every force feeding felt like a near-death experience. I realized many years later that the CCP had purposely shown my mother suffering in front of me as an attempt to psychologically wreck her will. I forgot how long it took until my mother was released, but I remember that my family barely enjoyed much time together. Because not long after we united, my father was kidnapped by the CCP in 2007, when I was only seven years old. My mother and I went on many multi-hour long bus rides trying to reach different official departments, asking them where exactly my father was taken to. They, were, they always dodged a question and pushed us to another department. When we finally found out where my father was, we demanded to visit him, but they told us it's not possible unless he gives up the practice. How ridiculous is that? What is the legal basis in that? 
In fact, the CCP has absolutely no legal basis in persecuting Falun Gong. All of the arrests, torturing, and murdering were done illegally, even according to its own laws. Since I could not see my father, I started writing to him. Because all our letters were monitored, we could not talk about sensitive topics. So I, so I would tell him about just getting very good grades in school, attending swimming lessons, and gaining a huge tan, learning Chinese calligraphy, but ended up staining my shirt with ink, and just sharing with him the small details of our life. Though he was living and fighting in the darkness, his letters were filled with so much light. It was the most thoughtful, encouraging advice and the most humorous phrases. They always brighten up my days. One year, just before my birthday, he wrote a tongue twister poem to me as a present. And that is the tongue twister he wrote. He put in so much thought and love into every letter he writes. Perhaps that was the only way he could fulfill his role as a father. Many years later, when I reread those letters, I realized he never talked about his sufferings with me. He always sounded so uplifting and told us not to worry about him. He apologized in multiple of his letters for not writing back to me soon enough. He apologized in multiple of his letters for not writing back to me soon enough because it's quite inconvenient. I did not think too much of it back then, but when I grew older and learned what had happened to him, my heart breaks every time I think about what those inconveniences could have been. Was it the daily 16 consecutive hours of forced labor? Was it day after day of being tied up to a chair without being allowed to move? Or was it, I cannot bear to think too much into it. He was released after a year and a half inside the forced labor camp, but not even two years later, he was kidnapped once again to a brainwashing camp, where his blood pressure shot up to the 200s and was extremely weak. The center officials did not want to bear the responsibility of yet another human life, so he was temporarily released to be medicated. And that's when we made the difficult decision of leaving everything behind and fled to Thailand to seek asylum from the United Nations. In 2013, we came to the United States. I feel incredibly fortunate and thankful to be together with my parents here, where I can tell you all about our experiences without worrying that I could be jailed. We're just an ordinary family. We just wanted a place where we could freely practice Falun Gong and freely believe in the principles of truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. And yet we had to risk everything to make that come true. At least 20 million individuals in China share the same wish, but it has not yet come true for them. Many of them are at this very moment that I'm speaking to you, being persecuted inside those dark cells. I cannot help but wonder if the Chinese Communist Party is as strong as it claims to be. Why is it so afraid of a group of people who just want to become better individuals and to benefit the society? And it's definitely not just the Falun Gong practitioners who are subjects to this brutal persecution. Sitting with us today, Ms. Geng He and Ms. Li Aijie, both of their husbands, Mr. Gao Zhisheng and Mr. Zhang Haitao, respectively, are still inside mainland China. People like them are warriors who endanger their own lives to speak for the persecuted people. They knew what could happen to them, and yet they fearlessly proceeded. I would like to hereby pass on my deepest respect and my most sincere gratitude to them. For all of us here in this free world, the least 
we can do is to tell more people about what you learned tonight and stand up firmly against the atrocities of the CCP. Thank you, everyone. Hello. Thank you all for your speech tonight. Um, I do appreciate it, and we are all glad to hear. Um, and we're, it's very painful to hear all these stories coming from um, China and hearing about people that are persecuted every day in these education camps. Uh, my question is for Mr. Fu. Um, so I recently read an article about Vera Zhao. She was a student at University of Washington, um, and you were very instrumental in helping her um, get um, out of China when she was trapped there with her family. Um, so I just wanted to see if you can maybe elaborate on there and tell us about more about how um, you were able to get her out together with the State Department and Secretary Mike Pompeo as well during the Trump administration. So. Thank you very much for that question. Um, where's Joe? She was a um, junior student at University of Washington when her when she traveled to China uh, back to her hometown in Xinjiang as um, I think about three years ago she uh, just actually had a major cancer surgery so but she uh, wanted to visit her biological father um, she, uh, her mother brought her to the United States when she was very young, about um, eight years old. Uh, and um, so she was pretty much educated here. Uh, her mother uh, married with a, uh, uh, she's an American citizen, naturalized citizen, and uh, um, her stepfather is a Dutch uh, American. After she went back to Urumuchi, uh, she um, just because she tried to submit her homework through a VPN uh, in a hotel in Urumuchi, the capital of uh, uh, Xinjiang, she was kidnapped, I mean surrounded at midnight by the military police, put a black hole and took her to a concentration camp. So her mother, of course, the first thing her mother did was to go to the University of Washington to appeal for intervention for the school at least to speak up. And instead, the university, I mean, this is a, a direct quote. I heard, not myself heard, but I heard directly from a U.S. State Department official in the room when I brought her mother to the State Department to ask for urgent intervention. And um, her, the State Department, actually that official, called the university president office and asked for the university to use this connection with China to intervene. You know what had happened? The university, a high level official, I won't name, said, sorry, we can't do anything because we have a two million dollar project negotiating with China now. I was wondering what kind of project. Later on, some journalist found during that time there was a Huawei, you know, the Chinese spying kind of company in the U.S., the, the, the cell phone company, uh, uh, kind of a donation project to University of Washington. 
And so I kind of uh, made a, a further effort and, um, and introduced uh, her mother to uh, Mr. Uh, the Matthew Pottinger at that time. Uh, Mr. Pottinger was the uh, deputy, uh, well, was the senior director for the uh, President Trump's uh, National Security Council in the White House. So it was really through some very high level uh, intervention and pressure and uh, China finally, after one year actually, one year after Vera was released from the concentration camp, she was still not allowed to go to come back to the US. She said one day she even had to cover her like hair and uh, most of her face, try to walk across the road in her father's neighborhood. Immediately after she crossed the road at Urumuchi, I, I, I think it's not even Urumuchi, another small city, the police just uh, grabbed her shoulder and took her and said, uh, have you committed a crime? The face recognition camera just to pick you up from that uh, red light. So we're glad at least uh, she was able to be back. The appeasement has become a complice. I think University of Washington is just one of the institutions. And how many have been accepting the CCP's cash, money, Confucius Institute, and uh, inviting the CCP spies coming into our university campus to brainwash, you know, I think we can all find them. I mean, just like two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the DOD indicted five of them. I'm glad at least we're still looking for this. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you guys so much for being here. It's an honor to be in your presences and to, to just hear your guys' stories. Um, I was very emotional. Um, I, I can't believe that these things are happening to humans in the world and that people are so silent about this issue. Um, I know even here at Berkeley, people have been tearing down our flyers and um, have been really hostile towards this event, which shocks me after hearing um, all of your personal accounts even more and uh, just makes my blood go cold. Um, my question is for all the panelists. Um, I don't know if, some, uh, if somebody can maybe translate to um, some of the panelists who don't speak English, um, but um, what do each pan uh, for each panelist, what do each of you think would be uh, the best way that we could support you here in the United States. Um, and that could be like emotional, it could be spiritual, it could be um, putting on events like this. Um, but uh, hopefully a personal answer from each of you guys just so we know what we can do. Um, I think it's pretty hot, very hot, because China is far away from the United States. And um, um, technically or practically, I would like to say, please say no to communism. You're helping yourself and you're helping us. Set the good model for the world. Please. That's what I want to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.我就你会帮我翻译啊希望下次有类似的活动能有更多的学生来 I hope that um, you guys can throw more events like this 
um, I hope that more university students, whether they're from the U.S. or international students, they can come to attend these events and learn more about um, communism. I'm, um, I'm seeing not that many students here, which I'm a little disappointed of, but hopefully next time there will be a greater student attendance here. 其实大家都知道现在在美国的大学校园里有一群这种来自中国的留学生我们称他为小粉红他们深受中共宣传的毒害在美国的校园里他们在尽量的维护中共的很多的事情在客观的在帮中共做很多的宣传其实美国大学的
Awesome. So I think we're going to move on to the next question. And um, let's keep the question short because I think we're running out of time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being all here today. It's an incredible honor to be in your presence <clears throat> and hear your stories. I oftentimes, when discussing with fellow students or friends or people who show sympathy towards the CCP, Marxism, socialism, communism, here in the United States, can often talk about my family who fled from China or fled from Eastern Europe and fled from Russia and fled from the communists. But it's been very difficult in many times uh, talking to students on campus or in other campuses who are very sympathetic to the CCP or talking to students who feel that the best thing they can do is just appease this government. They feel like there's no way out. They own student debt. They can do something to better themselves. How do we reach out and speak to people, and this is to anyone who can answer, how do we reach out and show some light, bring some truth, and convince people who may not even agree with communism at all, but it's the allure and the incentives the CCP offers people that they want and that they would like to receive? How do we show them the light? How do we inform them, show them another way? One by comparison. I mean, look, the, the CCP is the, Nazi, is the Nazi regime of our time, writ large. So don't be afraid to use accurate, although shocking, comparisons. That's what they are. They're worse than the Nazis in some ways, obviously, um, on scale. But you, you have to, as I said before, you have to push back. You have to be, have the courage of your convictions and not be afraid to be shouted down or whatever it might be and your professors will do that they'll they'll shut you down or but really it's 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 about not believing the narrative of the mainstream media um, not believing the narrative of mainstream education and presenting it with facts shine you shine the light you shine that light and say look this is this is what's real if this was 1938 we'd be protesting against the nazis well Hey, we didn't know what they were doing. Well, now we know what, they're, what the Chinese are doing, what the Chinese Communist Party is doing. And, and ask the question, why aren't you appalled? Why aren't you against it? So you, put the, you go on the offensive, perhaps. Ask them, why, why aren't you doing these things? Why aren't you against these things? Because there, there's plenty to be against. So it, it's, there's a lot of, you know, the tide is working the other way, right? The tide is in media, academia, political affiliations, all of that's favoring the Chinese right now, the Chinese Communist Party. But the reality is, is you get these great folks up here, who brave people who've, who are voices, where you can magnify their voices, write about it, talk about it. That's, you have to, it starts here at the university level. That's where it starts. Yeah, one quick point is, um, are, you know, there are two types of those uh, who resist the truth, right? So you have to make a discernment first. The first type is uh, they are either being sent directly by the Chinese state security or government with a political task just to carry out this uh, transnational repression. The FBI actually just uh, recently set up a special website to report, yeah, I mean, this is uh, against the law. So these people should be held accountable by the law. And if those who are really open for information, I think we should start, as Jim said, from the stories, from true stories. These are not abstract numbers of like 20 million, 30 million uh, you know, who died. These are happening right now. I mean, if you want to invite those uh, like we rescued, uh, from Xinjiang, the, the, the survivors, uh, Muslims, Christians alike. We can supply you uh, to have them speak, uh, you know, with their own experience, what had happened, what they have observed, uh, with objectivity. So I think uh, that hopefully can swim. And the, the, yeah, the truth will set them free, right? They need truth. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would also like to add on to that question. I think um, 
a lot of here in the West, they would, they would think, oh, okay, CCP bad, that is a China problem, right? Um, why, you know, um, okay, like um, maybe that's not that much we should criticize, it's like someone else's government. But actually, I think over the past two years, we have seen how the CCP's like suppression of free speech has like caused tremendous consequences here, even in the West. For example, um, maybe we all know the doctor who initially found out about um, you know COVID nineteen started spreading in China, um, Miss Doctor Li Wenliang, and he was he was shut up by the authorities. You know, if, if the Chinese government had not put its initial attention to suppressing free speech, suppressing, um, you, know, you know, doctors who are, you know, coming from that background, maybe so many lives could have been saved. It's, it's definitely not a China issue anymore. It's affecting everyone in the free world yeah, that's what I like to add. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Good evening to all the speakers. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. I'd like to show you a lot of honor for your bravery um, coming to speak with us today. Uh, my question today was directed at Mr. Fang Zheng, um, if you wouldn't mind translating for me. Um, you were um, a student in Beijing during the the Tiananmen massacre um, and you were there and you were showing your own bravery at that time and you believed in the movement for democracy um, and that was that was decades ago um, but what I was wondering today was and I think what over 1500 people right now who are watching online are wondering is what circumstances need to arise in China to revitalize that movement towards democracy, and how can we in America help with that? Do you mind asking the first part of your question again? Yeah, how can, uh, what circumstances need to arise in China to revitalize the movement towards democracy and then how can we help with that? Thank you for asking this 但是我知道在中国每一天我们都有很多的人在推动在从事这种促进中国民主的这种运动但是你要说具体的在中国有一个什么样的契机或者是有个什么样的机会能够使中国有这种民主转型这个我很难说但是现在有一个很很一个大家都在说的一个奇怪的问题就是说习近平本人就是一个总加速师那么习近平现在在中国国内做的这一切让人看到非常荒唐非常不可思议的这种事情其实客观上在加速中共的灭亡那使得中国的老百姓更多的
People call him an accelerator. He is an accelerator of um, the CCP's um, destruction. He's been doing a lot of, um, how should I say, I don't know how to translate, stupid things, uh, which would, which are sort of, in a way, waking people up to the CCP's atrocities. And um, yeah, people are getting to know CCP more就是说习近平本人所做的这些在中国的这种不可思议的事比如说现在这种所谓的清明政策各种各样的这种中国的这种倒退这种回到文革的这么一种状态使得中国老百姓更多的感觉到中国这个政权的荒诞这个政权的这
saving their, their money. At the same time, arable land, food, food supply chains are, are being disrupted. So the U.S. can do a lot. It was doing a lot. Um, we can do that again. We can put a lot of pressure on China for their support of Russia in the invasion of Ukraine. We can link behavior to um, and delink economically. And China is, is trying to counteract that, obviously, with purchasing farmland and, and, and here in America, factories and, and, and food processing plants and all kinds of agricultural areas in, in Latin America and other parts of Asia, Africa. So they're trying to <clears throat> kind of insulate themselves from that kind of um, economic uh, retaliation, but they can certainly be retaliated against um, economically, technologically. Um, the daughter of the Huawei owner was, was arrested in Canada and held for two years in house arrest. Um, the prior administration dissuaded many nations from using Huawei spyware, which was a loss. It cost China billions and billions and billions of dollars. So it's really about deciding that you're going to punish China. Plenty of places to do it, plenty of ways to do it um, effectively. It's, it's not a matter of can we, it's a matter of will we. Another I clarifying, could I ask a clarifying question? Would you draw a distinction between sanctions and tariffs? Yeah, so that's exactly I want to oh, okay, mention. Is uh, I think yeah, the one is the one thing government can really do is uh, to put effective sanction mechanisms. I think uh, the uh, Global Magnitsky Act, uh, the uh, for you know um, Human Rights Accountability Act. Uh, for the first time, really uh, starting after the genocide, after the Hong Kong, putting individuals. Remember, those atrocities were committed by those brutal individual Communist Party officials. They should be held accountable from Xi Jinping to the Politburo members. And uh, it was under Trump administration the first time to uh, Politburo members. Uh, uh, the first one is Chen Quanguo from the Xinjiang, the former Xinjiang uh, Party Secretary, was put on the list. And how many Communist Party officials has their relatives here in Silicon Valley, in California? I mean, how much wealth they had already got here? I mean, President George W. Bush told me, I mean, I can reveal privately, it's even back to that time, the Bush 43 time, he said uh, the CIA had uh, made a specific investigation about all these people, the Communist Party, the Saudis, their wealth, uh, were the corrupted wealth, were being stored here. So if the U.S. government is serious, they can really do a lot of things to stop this. Because if you only decry the party or political system, they don't feel the pain. I mean, so to uh, put tariffs, of course, that put a pain. But put this Communist Party, their own pocket, and their uh, concubines, they're, they're, you know, they're in Los Angeles. There's That's a word we don't use very often. But concubine village, you know, they, <laughs> they earnest. When, so they, they need to be sanctioned. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot of things. I mean, this sanction uh, mechanism certainly need to be there. Yeah. Uh, you're welcome. I'm very happy to answer this question. I'm an American. My American is the lawyer. My is 今天是我先生强制失踪的第一千七百零六天。我认为美国政府议员康冠斯任何的政府应该在公开的场合提我先生的名字。啊，美国大使馆的官员应该去找我的先生，因为我是美国的公民，我先生是公民的家属。谢
So she feels American government, the United States government, has um, the duty, I mean, to obligation to solve the problem. At least in public, they, the government um, has the responsibility to declare publicly to Chinese, China, China's government to release the family member of a American citizen. That's what she was trying to say. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for your responses. Okay, I think we're gonna do one more question since we're running out of time, so go ahead. Could you repeat your question, please? Um, I, I'm saying when, um, like, what, what can you do when, when you know, t like Tiananmen massacre happened and the West just throws tons of money to China still? Like, like what, what should we do, like, uh, to stop this? Or what's the biggest, the strongest method for them to stop? The strongest method is decoupling, economic decoupling from China. Yeah, totally agree. It has to happen. If it doesn't, there's, there's no remedy, um, except for within China. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, China spends more on domestic security than it does on its entire defense budget. So Xi Jinping has a big worry about Chinese people themselves. So we'll have to see. But um, yeah, economic decoupling is the answer. We were doing that. We're not doing that so much today. Definitely on the current presidency, right? Uh, thank you. All right, thank you everyone for uh, attending our event. Thank you for everyone in person. Thank you to approximately, I think it was uh, 1,500 people online. Um, for those of you who wanna get involved with the Berkeley College Republicans, we have our weekly meetings on Wednesdays in Wheeler 104 from 8 to 9 p.m. It was a privilege hosting our incredible speakers today, and we're looking forward to massive, incredible speaker events in, uh, in the future, next semester. So thank you everyone and have a great night.